Content warning. The following features a character who engages in self-harm. Viewer discretion is advised. Previously on Snoot Game. And we're back. The next day, Fang refuses to let Anon go to school, and they don't go either. The two spend the day playing video games, watching movies, and feeding cornflakes to Metal Gear Rainba. Anon notices that Fang seems depressed and figures it has to do with the band. The day after that, Anon is feeling good enough to go to school, but Fang isn't. They also don't want to go home. Anon panics a bit about how he's never had a girlfriend before and now suddenly he has one staying at his house. He's also worried about what Trish, Ripley, and Nasser will do to him when they find out. Speaking of Nasser, he finds Anon and violently shoves him into the lockers, demanding to know where Fang is. Their dad is furious and has been taking it out on Nasser, blaming him for everything that Fang and Anon do together. He was even going to file a missing persons report before Fang sent them a text. Anon tells Nasser that Fang is at his apartment, emphasizing that nothing happened physically between them. In fact, due to his injuries, they weren't even able to kiss, which doesn't do much to calm Nasser down. Anon admits that he told Fang he likes them and that Fang liked him back. This sends Nasser over the edge, which causes the other students to finally notice that the school president's boyfriend is assaulting that dork from the assembly. Nasser comes to his senses and leaves Anon alone. Just in time for Fang to text Anon. He doesn't tell them what Nasser did, but he does say that they should text him. At the end of the school day, Anon is feeling a lot of mixed emotions, and bruises. On the one hand, he's excited about his new hot tarot GF, but on the other hand, Fang might be having a mental breakdown in his apartment right now, and the only thing he knows less about than mental health is how to be a good boyfriend. Or a boyfriend at all, for that matter. His worrying is interrupted when Nasser texts him to meet up in the auditorium. Anon goes, fearing for his life, and Nasser apologizes for hurting him. He says that Fang and Anon being a couple was like a worst-case scenario to him, but as long as they're happy, he can be too. Anon lets Nasser know that Fang isn't exactly happy, that they broke up with their band and they haven't been able to leave his apartment. Nasser gets frustrated, venting about how when they were younger there weren't any issues between them, and now Fang won't even talk to him. He has to find out how they're feeling from other people. First Trish and Reed, and now Anon. He feels like he did something wrong that caused Fang to hate him, but he doesn't understand what. There's actually two versions of this scene. Uh, Martin Yoon 5252 was nice enough to let me know how to get both of them. If we had stayed quiet on the roof long enough to let Fang finish speaking, but still gotten this ending, we would have learned what caused the initial rift between the siblings. Which makes this dialogue a little bit different. In either version, Nasser buries his face in his hands and tells Anon to leave. When Anon gets home, his door is locked and Fang seems to be trying to stall him from coming into the apartment. He opens the door and Fang seems very anxious and clingy. Also, they ate all the food he had in the kitchen. He decides to make a quick run to the store, but Fang begs him not to go. Realizing that something is very wrong, he checks in the bathroom and he sees that there's feathers around the toilet bowl and a few streaks of blood in the shower. Fang had been preening and trying to hide the evidence. Some people seem to think that Fang only does this in Ending 3, but I think it's implied that they've been doing this to themselves since the beginning. It's just that at the beginning and in the other bad endings, Anon is too self-centered to notice. The way Cavemanon depicts Fang's self-harm and how Anon reacts to it is heartbreakingly accurate in my opinion. It's definitely a rough read if you or someone you know has dealt with similar problems. Fang can't stand to be left alone, but also doesn't want to go anywhere, especially not to school. They're even considering dropping out. The main person they're trying to avoid is Trish, because Fang wants space and Trish keeps on trying to talk to them. I think Trish is probably worried about Fang, but she isn't self-aware enough to realize that not respecting their boundaries is making things worse. Anon is way out of his depth and isn't sure how to help. He doesn't have any other friends he can turn to, either. He suggests that Fang gets in touch with Nasser, and they're open to the idea, but not right now. The next day, Anon makes Fang swear on their guitar that they won't start preening again. On the front steps, he sees Stella and Rosa gossiping. Apparently, there's a rumor going around that Fang and Anon eloped together. You have a choice to talk to them or not, and we need all the help we can get. Anon tells them about how Fang is refusing to leave his apartment, and Rosa gives him her phone number and offers to do what she can to help. At lunch, Trish tries to confront Anon while Reed tries to talk her out of it, understanding that Fang needs room to breathe right now. Anon hurries up to the rooftop to avoid them, which is also where he's been eating since the auditorium stopped being an option. That evening, when he gets back to his apartment, he's momentarily heartbroken as Fang is sleeping in his bed surrounded by white feathers, but it turns out that they just ripped one of his pillows in half. 
They did this because their phone rang and it said Reed was calling. They built up the courage to talk to him, but it was Trish using his phone. They felt like they needed to destroy something, so... the pillow. It's clear that Fang needs some kind of intervention. They can't just live in Anon's apartment forever. So Anon suggests that they go to Moe's for dinner. While Fang goes to grab a quick shower, Anon calls Rosa and gets her to bring Nasser to the restaurant. The four all end up sitting together and everyone is uncomfortable, until Mo interrupts. He realizes that they aren't on a double date and sends Rosa and Anon to a separate table so that he, Fang, and Nasser can have a family discussion. We don't find out what they talk about in this ending. Anon also ends up venting all his recent stress to Rosa, which helps him feel better. Mo calls Anon and Rosa back to the table and leaves them to the rest of their dinner. Fang and Nasser are acting more comfortable around each other than we've ever seen them, and that night, Fang returns home to their family. The next day at school, Fang is finally back in classes, and also super grounded. A very sad-looking Reed approaches Anon by himself and asks if he can convince Fang to give Trish another chance. Anon is hesitant, but agrees as long as he can be there for the confrontation, and he and Fang are allowed to leave at any time. The fact that Reed has to go through Anon to talk to Fang now means that they've cut off communication with him, too. Anon texts Fang, who is even more hesitant, but they agree to meet with Trish at lunch as long as Anon and Reed are there, too. Lunchtime rolls around, and Reed meets up with Anon by himself. He hurries Anon along to the cafeteria. Anon's phone keeps getting texts, but Reed keeps shoving Anon, preventing him from looking at them. This causes Anon to drop his phone, which Reed takes, before apologizing. Anon drops his tray and begins sprinting to the auditorium at full speed, but Reed chases him, going as far as to pull the fire alarm to slow him down. The hallways fill up with panicking students. Anon makes it to the auditorium despite this, and Reed puts him in a headlock out of desperation. Reed was my favorite character up until this point, so I was really shocked by his blatant betrayal. It's clear that Reed believes he's doing the right thing, that Fang and Trish just need to hug and make up and then everything can go back to how it was. He opens the door to the auditorium to show Anon that it's going well, and we see that not only is it not going well, but Trish and Fang are practically at each other's throats. Fang tells Trish that her recent behavior has them questioning their entire friendship, the band, their gender identity, everything. All the time Fang spent being angry and edgy and mean to their family because of Trish's influence and encouragement feels like wasted time. Though it does kind of seem like Fang is deflecting some of the blame here, Trish definitely encouraged them to behave badly. Trish thinks that Anon is a bad influence, but ironically, or maybe hypocritically, she doesn't seem to understand that she's also leading Fang down a bad path. Trish pushes away and attacks everyone who disagrees with her, and up until Trish hurt Anon, Fang didn't see any problem with this behavior. Trish lets her anger get the better of her. She completely unloads on Anon, unaware that he's in earshot, calling him a penniless, worthless nobody, implying that he'd be physically abusive and that they'd both end up being trailer trash. She even brings up Fang's earlier insecurity that they won't ever amount to anything, and says if they kick Trish out of their life and stay with Anon, that's exactly what's going to happen. Reed has heard enough. He believed in Trish, that she was going to be better, but she used him again. He quietly gives Anon his phone back and walks away in shame. He barely shows up at the story after this. I think it's because of the guilt. Anon dramatically enters the auditorium, and his presence seems to re-energize Fang. They tell Trish to fuck off and stay out of their life. Trish leaves, and Fang is emotionally destroyed. They curl into a ball and cry. Anon holds their hand as the bell rings for music class, and then the late bell. Now that their band has broken up for good, it seems like Fang doesn't see the point in taking music seriously. We skip ahead to April 1st. Anon and Fang are in science class when Spears announces prom on the intercom, and Fernsworth comes over to see how Anon and Fang are doing. Anon remembers Fang's pronouns this time, only they don't seem happy about it. Fang confides in Anon that she no longer feels comfortable identifying as non-binary since it reminds her of how toxic she used to be. She's completely racked with shame and anxiety over how she behaved at the beginning of the year and completely blames Trish for all of it. She says that it would be okay for Anon to call her Lucy. Now, I think having a story where a teenager identifies as trans or non-binary and then decides that it's not for them is fine and pretty realistic. It's easy to see this as some kind of political statement, but I really don't think that that was the writer's intentions. Identity is a fluid thing. The person you are now isn't necessarily going to be the same person that you are five or even ten years from now. When I was a teenager, I was running around dressed like an anime character, thinking of changing my name to something like Vandal or Harbinger. That being said, this is not a positive development for Lucy. I think being Fang was a way for Lucy to disassociate from all the things that she didn't like about herself, and now she also feels the need to disassociate from being Fang. The name on her text box even changes to reflect this. 
Anon invites Lucy to prom, and she's delighted. Although they didn't finish their science assignment, so they go to Anon's house after school to work on it. Lucy opens up about how she's struggling in all of her classes, because at the beginning of the year, her and Trish signed up for as many together as possible, and now it's really awkward. Trish keeps staring at her, and Lucy is even having nightmares where she confronts her directly. Rosa and Stella have been helping Anon and Fang to hang out together by letting them spend time at the gardening club, and they've even been keeping Trish company so that she doesn't fixate on Lucy as much. The four of them end up having a barbecue and a campout in Rosa's giant backyard to watch the lunar eclipse, something that holds great spiritual significance to Stella, but everyone else is just here to have fun. The three dinosaurs assume that Anon must know how to set up a tent and start a fire based on caveman stereotypes, and with some help, he's able to. Rosa and Stella leave Lucy and Anon alone to enjoy their date, and it's pretty wholesome. We skip ahead to prom night. Anon arrives at Lucy's house wearing his dad's tuxedo, and meets up with Naomi in the front yard, who's dressed like Chun-Li from Street Fighter. And Nasser opens the door. He's either supposed to be Kiryu from Yakuza, or the vice principal from Ned's Declassified. Lucy's mom is super excited to see Anon, and she's able to rein in Ripley from being too menacing. They all pose for dozens of photos while Anon waits for Lucy to finish getting ready. My favorite is this one because it's physically impossible. She comes downstairs in a white dress that her mom picked out for her, the polar opposite of her usual clothing. And earlier she talked about hating the way that her mom used to dress her, but now she's going along with what she wants? Does Lucy actually want to wear this dress, or is she just wearing it because it's what's expected of her? Her mom takes even more pictures before they leave. Suddenly, Naomi makes up an excuse to talk to Anon alone in the kitchen. She lets her fake positive attitude drop, and tells Anon that while she's thankful that he helped to fix Lucy and Nasser's relationship, she doesn't think that Lucy is completely better. She just avoids everyone at school, and Nasser is constantly texting with her, so much that it's affecting his school duties. She sees Nasser being less uptight as a sign that Anon has been a bad influence on the siblings, but the more concerning part is that Nasser and Anon seem to have replaced Trish as Lucy's emotional support, and she's leaning heavily on both of them. Anon ignores these concerns and shuts down Naomi, saying that all he's done is be supportive of Fang and he never consented to being a part of her stupid plan in the first place. Naomi quickly puts away her angry face as Lucy's mom enters the kitchen. After more photos, everyone piles into the NASCAR to head to prom. Once they arrive, we can see that Naomi coordinated her dress to match the prom decorations. Oh, and according to a comment from Help Me hyphen JV5WX, if you arrange the Hanzi on these lanterns in the right way, it translates to The Chinese government has never done anything wrong, especially not in 1989. They do not even have tanks. Which is kind of a weird thing to have as an easter egg, but it is interesting. Anon and Nasser go to grab food, making the questionable decision to leave Naomi and Lucy alone together. In an attempt to be friendly, she ends up overwhelming Lucy with questions and offers to hang out because Lucy needs new friends anyway. This causes Lucy to leave the table. Anon follows her to a corner of the gymnasium. She's beating herself up for ruining everyone's good time by not being happy. Her self-esteem is completely gone. She and Anon decide to let it go and just enjoy the rest of their night together. Then, Spears approaches with a clipboard to let Lucy know that the surprise she filed paperwork for a few weeks ago is ready. Lucy didn't file paperwork for anything, though. Spears says she's on in 10 minutes? Suddenly, Trish, Stella, and Rosa appear behind her with instruments. Trish, who is visibly exhausted and clearly stressed out, filed paperwork under Lucy's name to surprise her by making her perform on prom night. This behavior makes sense for Trish, but why would Stella and Rosa help with this? Well, according to them, they've noticed how Trish and Lucy are both miserable. I can kind of see why they might think having a good concert could help Lucy come out of her shell and reconnect with Trish, but this isn't the way to do it. Naomi, Trish, Stella, and Rosa all mean well in their attempts to reach out to Lucy, but none of them are taking her feelings into consideration. She runs away, and Trish follows. Anon tries to stop Trish, but Rosa holds him back. He asks why they had to try this on prom night of all nights, and why couldn't this wait for any other day? Rosa lets Anon know that they have been trying to get Lucy and Trish to talk things out for a long time now. For some reason, Lucy never told Anon about this. I wonder what else she hasn't been telling him. Stella says that she did a tarot reading that said that this would go well, and that Lucy would achieve fulfillment and completion after tonight. But it turns out, Rosa peeked at the cards when Stella was out of the room and, not understanding how they work, flipped the upside-down ones right-side up. We know by now Stella's cards are always right, so Anon goes after Lucy. She's huddled in the opposite corner of the gym with her hands over her ears to block out Trish. Trish apologizes to Anon and tries to get him to help convince Lucy to make amends, and then Rosa and Stella catch up. They agree that Lucy should give Trish a chance. Anon says that they're overwhelming her and they all need to back off. 
Stella and Rosa agree and begin trying to talk Trish down. But Trish sees this as them abandoning her too, so enraged, she grabs Lucy's arm and tries to force her onto the stage. Rosa blocks Trish and Anon is able to get her to let go. She gives up and leaves finally. Lucy says that she needs to get away from the crowd and her and Anon head to the hallways. Stella and Rosa try to follow to see if she's going to be alright, but Anon waves them off. In the halls, Lucy looks absolutely devastated and Anon tries to get her to talk about it, but she just wants to move past it. Yeah, I'm sure that's healthy. She also says that she doesn't want to see anyone other than Anon, not Trish, Reed, Stella, or Rosa, just Anon. Anon seems to think that she's talking about tonight, but given what happens later, I think she means forever. Lucy blames herself for what just happened, saying that she ruined everything for everyone again. Anon doesn't know how to respond to that, but he reassures her that none of this is her fault. She says she has to go to the bathroom. I think this might just be an excuse to go preen, but that's just an idea. Anon goes to get them some water or something while she's in there, and Trish approaches him one last time. She asks if Lucy is okay, if she's happy. Anon says he thinks so, her and Nasser are back on speaking terms at least. Trish also asks if she said anything about her, specifically whether or not she can ever forgive her. Anon tells Trish straight up that this shit needs to stop. He tells her how Lucy has been having nightmares about Trish doing something exactly like what just happened. Their friendship could maybe have been salvaged, but not tonight. Not like this. He tells her that she's doing more harm by staying here, and advises her to just give Lucy some space. Trish begins to cry. She gives Anon one last message for Lucy, that she only wants her to be happy, and she'll never see or hear from Trish ever again. And we never see any of Lucy's friends after this. Anon meets up with Lucy in the hallways, and they decide to walk back to her house and get some fresh air. As they pass through the park, Anon spots a familiar hot dog cart, which is inexplicably still open despite the fact that it's 10pm. The nice hot dog lady waves them over. I'm pretty sure her name is Tracy, because the song that plays in the background whenever she shows up is called Tracy Was Fired From Her Real Job. Uh, this is later confirmed by Nasser. Fang and Anon decide to get some hot dogs since neither one of them really got to eat at the prom. While Tracy cooks, she tries to make conversation by asking how their night went, unintentionally making things awkward. Anon says that the night was a total wash, and she lets them know that the night is still young. She says that prom isn't that important. The important thing is making good memories, and she advises them to do something memorable before the night is over. Then she starts closing up shop. Lucy and Anon decide to go to her house to watch movies or something, though her dad has a very limited selection. When they get there, they see that Lucy's parents are gone, probably having their own date night somewhere. Lucy gets into the house by kicking over a fake rock with a key tape to it that her parents don't know is there, explaining that she got kicked out a lot and had to find her own ways back inside. They go inside, and Lucy changes back into her usual outfit, and then moves the living room furniture to give them a dance floor. She turns on her parents' antique radio, and also an overhead blacklight, which reveals that she has glowing accent marks in her feathers. This is called bioluminescence, and some animals in real life actually have it. The two end up awkwardly dancing together to old music in a really sweet scene, though Anon steps on her toes a few times. Prom might have gone terribly, but at least the night ended on a good note. Three months later, speeding right past graduation and summer vacation, Anon, Lucy, and Nasser are all having lunch at the park, talking about Nasser's summer job as a delivery driver and flinging chili cheese fries at his expensive jacket. Tracy is also here, selling hot dogs again. She asks them how they've been doing since graduating. Lucy says she has no idea what she wants to do with her life, not even considering anything music-related as an option. To change the subject, Tracy asks if Anon and Lucy have any plans now that they are both adults, which unintentionally brings the mood down. Anon had two options, college or the military, and in this ending, he goes to the military. He and Lucy spent the entire summer together, but this is their last day. He's leaving tomorrow, and Lucy completely cut off everyone besides him and her family. So when Nasser leaves for college, she's gonna be completely alone except for her parents. Tracy tries to reassure her that she shouldn't blame herself for what happened with her friends and that she still has what's most important. She leaves, and Nasser drives Lucy and Anon to his apartment so they can spend one last night together. It's mostly empty now since his things are all packed up in storage. Unfortunately, this likely includes Metal Gear Rainbow since we don't see him again in this ending. His fate is unknown. Rest easy, soldier. Lucy and Anon end up going through all the photos they took together this summer on Lucy's phone. It's all good memories, until they get to some older shots with Rosa, Stella, Reed, and Trish in them. 
Lucy doesn't want to delete them, but can't stand to look at them either. She says she'll look at them again when she feels like letting go was really the best decision. The two eat cup noodles, and Anon boops Lucy's snoot. This is a literary trope known as Chekhov's snoot, which states that if a snoot appears in a story, it is sure to be booped before the ending. In the morning, Anon reflects on all the changes that Lucy has made this year, and wonders if she'll really be okay when he's gone. Lucy takes some pictures of him, and they sit in heavy silence, which is broken when she asks Anon if he really has to go. He does his best to comfort her. She asks if he thinks she's better the way she was before, or the way she is now. He says the way she is now is better, because she isn't as aggressive, but she's an insecure, anxious mess, so I definitely wouldn't call this better. Anon says that she just needs to be true to herself, and she'll find new interests. Nasser is unexpectedly late to pick them up, so they get a bit more time together. Anon realizes that this might be the last time they ever see each other, so he tells Lucy that he doesn't want her to waste her life waiting for him, and they put their relationship on hold for now. He seems to be doing this in the hopes that it'll give her some room to grow while he's gone. Lucy looks back at her old identity with a lot of self-loathing, referring to the way she used to be as a thing. Nasser finally shows up, having been delayed by Tracy. He drives Lucy and Anon to the pickup point at the bus station. Lucy excuses herself and goes into the office, hopefully not to Preen. Nasser tries to make conversation and asks Anon what he'll be doing in the army. He says he's going to try and become 46R, which is apparently a public affairs mass communication specialist. Basically, the army has their own news broadcasts, and Anon wants to either announce, write, or produce for them. He describes this as like shitposting, but more official. The bus arrives, and Nasser steps away to give Anon and Lucy some time alone together. They both promise that if they see each other again, they'll be better people. He steps onto the bus, and the last thing he sees as it pulls away is Lucy hugging Nasser and crying. We skip ahead three entire years. Anon is all grown up and back in Volcadera Bluffs. He managed to get a job in town as a recruiter, and he wonders if Lucy still lives here, which means that they haven't kept in touch all this time. Not even letters? He heads to a nearby park to grab something out of a vending machine, and he sees that they have some kind of festival set up. There's a bunch of dino kids running around. He thinks about Lucy, who coincidentally appears, running into his arms and kissing him, which seems romantic at first, but if you think about it, it's kind of alarmingly desperate, especially since he didn't even recognize her. They haven't spoken in three years, after all. Lucy seems to have reinvented herself once again as she stands before him in modest, traditionally feminine clothing. She got her associate's degree and then got a job working with children. She explains that kids are innocent and careless, and she has a lot of nostalgia for that time in her life. She clearly still deeply regrets everything she did in her teen years, and she feels a need to protect them from making the same kind of mistakes that she did. Anon comments on how she's changed, and he asks her how everyone else is doing. This confuses Lucy, so he clarifies. Nasser, Naomi, Trish, Reed, Rosa, Stella, everyone. She says that Nasser is in med school now, and she winces when remembering her other friends. She hasn't seen any of them since she cut ties all those years ago. Anon wants to go around town with her to see what else has changed, especially at their old school. Lucy doesn't want to go back there, though, but she does ask her supervisors for some time off. In light of the fact that her boyfriend just got back from overseas, they give her the rest of the day. They go for a walk on the beach, and Lucy explains that she never felt the need to reconnect with her old friends because she felt like she didn't need anyone in her life besides Anon. Even though he hasn't been there. Hmm. They end up walking the same path Anon used to take to school, and he really wants to see the old campus, but Lucy says no and gets really upset when he tries to convince her. Clearly there's more to her avoidant behavior than just not feeling like she needs to reconnect. Instead, they decide to go to Moe's, though we won't be seeing him since according to Lucy he sold the franchise and moved a long time ago. That's probably for the best in case police ever find the bodies. They sit at their usual table, and Lucy opens up about how much she struggled after Anon left. She says that she tried her best to improve herself, but she would often break down crying. She realized how mean she had been to her family, and she didn't want to make them sad anymore, so she learned to be grateful for everything that they did for her. Anon asks if she kept on playing music, and sadly she did not. She just gave it up completely because it reminded her too much of Trish, and she didn't feel like she needed it anymore. Anon asks what she's been doing all this time then, and she explains that it started when her dad had food to bring to a charity event. Nasser was at school, so he brought her to help out. She thought that she would have a really boring time, but she found the kids unexpectedly endearing, mainly how friendly and innocent they were. 
So she asked around at her church and got a job working with preschoolers, casually revealing that she became religious while Anon was gone. Probably out of some need for a purpose, it's not uncommon for people to turn to faith when going through times of crisis. Anon wants to bring up her old friends again, but he doesn't want to upset her, noting that she seems happy, but there's something hollow about it. She clearly still has a lot of healing to do. Anon convinces her to try to play the piano one more time. At first she's nervous that she won't be able to, but she still can, choosing to play the song that she wrote on the roof with Anon all those years ago. Which means that even though she stopped playing music, she still kept that one song in her mind. Back in music class, when she was explaining how she first got interested in music, she said that it was when her grandma taught her how to play church songs on the piano. If Fang was Lucy's impression of a rock star, the type of person that she thought Trish wanted her to be, then maybe this new Lucy is her impression of the type of person she thinks her grandmother would have wanted her to be. But is either one genuinely who she is? It starts to get dark, and Anon and Lucy leave. While they're walking through the park, Anon tells her that he thinks she should become a music teacher, but she isn't very confident. It's cold, so he gives her his jacket. Noticing how, now that he's stronger and taller than her, she seems fragile. This is a notion that Fang would have pushed away at the start of the game. But this new Lucy is clearly very fragile. He says that he'll get her back into music, and even back in touch with her old friends, eventually. And she says no, that she can't do that, because she isn't ready. She lied a bit earlier when she said she just didn't feel like she needed anyone else. And now she feels like she disappointed Anon, confessing that she started preening again for a while when he went away, but she has since stopped. She feels like Anon expected her to be a big musician, and she failed by not living up to his expectations or her potential. Anon reassures her that he's proud of her anyway. He still thinks she's the best, and they're together now, which is all that matters. A statement that Lucy will take very literally. They head back to the motel that Anon is staying at, and he unpacks his luggage, as well as his heavier memories of his time in the service. His torso is covered in scars, though it's unclear if he was in active combat, or if this is from him being accident-prone. Most likely the former, though. They stay up talking until dawn, and they plan to spend a day together, and also to meet up with Lucy's family. They hug, and we get some funny credits, because everyone involved in this project is anonymous. Afterwards, we see a snapshot of Lucy and Anon's wedding day. It's important to note that apart from Lucy's family in the background, nobody is here. When I first got this ending on my blind playthrough, my initial impression was, Okay, that's, that's not the worst. Sometimes you have a lot of passions when you're younger, and then you can't always stick th through them to adulthood, and that doesn't mean that you can't be happy. And while that might be a nice idea, it's 100% me coping. Ending 3, Lucy seems happy, but she's a shadow of her former self. She threw away everything that once defined her. And her eyes are closed now, too. Just like her mother's. That could be a coincidence, and I'm reading too much into it, or it could be something more symbolic. This bad ending is nowhere near as tragic as the other two, but it's still not good. And we don't really see what happens after the wedding. Hopefully therapy. We can, at least, take solace in the fact that Anon and Lucy are happy, despite it all. After getting this ending on my first playthrough, I was tempted to fix the two mistakes that I made and get the good ending next. Those were studying, when I should have shared Fang's interest in music, and speaking up on the roof when I should have stayed quiet. A mistake that I often find myself making in real life. But for the sake of completion, I had to see just how bad things could get. Join me next time as we stare into the heart of darkness.